morning. We're awake. We're ready. <laughs> Guess we'll see. <laughs> We've been going through the book of Romans together, verse by verse. And so I invite you to turn there with me if you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do. Open up to the book of Romans. And also, I want to encourage you to uh, find Matthew chapter 22 and put a finger in there too. That's going to come in handy later on um, as we go through the text of Romans. So Matthew 22, put a finger in there. And then also, let's go to Romans chapter 1. So your finger is in Matthew 22, and we will uh, read from Romans chapter 1 for now. And if you can stand with me for the reading of God's word, starting in chapter 1 of Romans, verse 1. And today we will be focusing on verses 6 and 7. Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, concerning his son, who is descended from David according to the flesh, who was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you, including you, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Verse 7, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Oh God, as we turn now to your word, we want to hear what you have to say. Oh God, we have not gathered to hear the opinions of a man, but we have gathered to hear your word and to sing praises, honor, and glory to you. And so, Father, by your Holy Spirit, in this hour, grant us spiritual ears to hear what you have to say. Grant us by your Holy Spirit minds to understand your words and your thoughts, your truth, and grant us hearts to believe what you have to say. And I pray you will grant us as well this uh, deep desire to live for the praise of your glorious grace. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Do you know who you really are? Do you know who you really are? If you do, you are in the minority. The majority of people do not know who they are. Many people believe the lie that they are the valueless byproduct of the unplanned impersonal, blind forces of evolution that have been playing out for millions or billions of years. Because of the lies that people have been told, it's likely that you know personally an individual who thinks he is merely a highly evolved animal or an accident or just an embarrassment to the family or whatever else people imagine themselves to be. Some are so confused about their identity that boys think they're girls, girls think they're boys, or cats. It would be funny if it weren't so sad. When we do not know God's truth about who we are, we end up with an identity crisis. And an identity crisis that can overflow into consequences that are sad and horrific. When we do not know who we are according to the God of the Bible, the results can be confusion, depression, 
and suicide. When we don't know who we are, healthy bodies are mutilated. When we don't know what a human being is, it's much easier for us to justify bullying, or worse, racism, war, and genocide. But when we know who we are, according to what God says about us, then at least we understand that because we've been lovingly created by God in his image, we have inherent worth. And we have purpose. And we have inalienable rights and responsibilities to one another as human beings. Uh, We find ourselves today looking at verse 6 of chapter 1 of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans. And you might recall that back in verse 1, if you were here, uh, Paul identified himself. He told us who he is. He informed us that he is a servant, or literally a slave of Christ Jesus. In verse 1, Paul also wrote that God called him to a specific vocation. That is, to, the, to the, the, the apostleship. He also wrote that God had set him apart for the gospel of God. Then in verses 2 and 5, 2 to 5, Paul explained what the gospel is, and he elaborated on how his apostleship connects to that gospel. Well, now in verse 6, where we are today, Paul begins to identify the recipients of his letter. He starts describing their identity. He writes that they are called to belong to Jesus Christ. And then in verse 7, he will go on to write that they are loved by God and called to be saints. This is who the recipients of this letter are. Sure, they are in Rome, they are Romans. However, that is a temporary and a superficial designation. Who they are and who they will be forever are those whom God loves dearly and those whom God has called to belong to Jesus and whom God has called to be saints. This is who they are forever. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then this is who you are. This is your identity, now and forever. So it will be my task today to explain, God helping me, from the scriptures, what it means to be called. And Lord willing, next Sunday, we'll consider what it means to be loved by God. So the title of this sermon is, Christian, You Are Called by God. This sermon will have three points all of which I'm going to frame as questions for us. And the scriptures will provide the answers. The first question is this, who are the called? Who are the called? In verse 6, Paul writes, the recipients of his letter are called. Then in verse 7, at the end, he says it again, they are called. Well, then who are the called? I think you will find it easy to agree with me that Paul is not referring here to all of humanity. Not all of humanity is called in the sense that Paul means here. Paul is using the term narrowly. And so that when he refers to the recipients of his letter as called, he's referring to authentic, blood-bought, spirit-born followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is, in other words, referring to real Christians. In verse 6, the called are those who belong to Jesus Christ. Well, to belong to Jesus is to be a Christian. In verse 7, the called are those who are saints, which literally means holy ones. Holy ones. Well, to be a saint, to be a holy one, is to be a Christian. And so, we see that the called are Christians. To be a Christian is to be called. And we can verify that this is true by considering other scriptures, 
For example, in Romans 8, verse 30, Paul will write that those whom God called, he also justified, and those whom God justified, he also glorified. What is always true of the called, of the called, what is always, always true of the called, is that they are those whom God has justified and whom God will also glorify. In other words, the called are those whom God has acquitted in his courtroom because of their faith in Jesus and whom God has promised to glorify by conforming them fully, perfectly to the image of his Son. The point then that we are trying to make at this stage is that the called are Christians. If you're a Christian, then you are called. This is who you are. Now then, this begs an obvious question, namely, what does this mean? <laughs> this brings us to our second main point, which I'm going to also frame as a question, which is this. What does it mean to be called? We're going to spend most of our time thinking about this. What does it mean to be called? To answer this question, let's begin by considering one of Jesus' parables. If you have your finger in that other passage I mentioned earlier, it's going to be easy for you to find. Matthew 22, and in verses 1 to 14. Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14. In my Bible, it's titled, The Parable of the Wedding Feast. This parable vividly explains who is in the kingdom of God and who is outside the kingdom of God. That is, who is saved and who is not saved, and why. Let me read the parable for us, beginning in verse 2, where Jesus begins speaking. Jesus says this, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. And again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I, I've prepared for my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves that have been slaughtered. Everything's ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention. They went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. In verse 7, Jesus now explains the reaction of the king. The king was angry. And he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their cities. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. That's a pretty good place to end the parable, don't you think? But Jesus continues concluding with a surprising twist. Verse 11. But when the, king, when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, pay a close attention to what Jesus says next in verse 14. Here is the main point of the whole parable. For many are called. How many? Many are what? Called. But how many are chosen? Few are chosen. Many are called. Few are chosen. Now, as I said before, this parable is about who is saved and therefore in the kingdom of God, and who is not saved, and therefore outside the kingdom of God, and why that's the case. And understanding the why will help us to comprehend in what sense you and I as Christians are called in Paul's letter. So let's think carefully about the meaning of this parable. What Jesus is saying is that the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, this is a beautiful image. The king is God the Father who has prepared the wedding feast for his son who is Jesus. And as the king, God the Father is also, is also the one who dispatched his servants who are his prophets 
to the nation of Israel. He dispatches prophets to call the Jews to repent and believe in Jesus, their Messiah. In other words, God the Father commissioned his prophets to call them to the wedding feast of Jesus, his son, but they would not come. Many of them were called, but they did not come. Some of them paid no attention, while others were hostile, even murdering the prophets. And as judgment, God the king chose to burn the apostate city in Jerusalem, of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But God the king chose to send more servants, such as Paul and the other apostles, to the Gentiles to call them to the wedding feast of Jesus. That is, to call them to repent and believe in Jesus the Messiah. Many of them, though, refuse. But a few of them, relatively speaking, do receive Jesus, filling the wedding hall. But now, every now and then, there is an imposter among them. A guest who says he belongs to Jesus, but who has not trusted in Jesus, and therefore is not wearing the wedding garment of the perfect righteousness of Christ. And in the end, what will God do to such a one? Condemn that guest and cast him into hell. Now then, Jesus is saying all of this to drive home the point of verse 14. For many are called, but few are chosen. In the context of this parable, Jesus is pointing out that the gospel is reaching many people. And that gospel is God calling out the many to repent and believe in his son so that they will be saved from sin and death and brought into his kingdom to be guests at the wedding feast of his son. And in this sense, the many are called. God calls the many in a general sense. However, not all who hear this general call of God through the gospel respond with repentance and faith in Jesus. In fact, relatively speaking, from among that many, there are only a few who repent and believe in Jesus. And there are fewer than we think. There are fewer than we think because a number of those who seem to have repented and believe in Jesus really have not. They are imposters, not wearing the wedding garment. Now let me ask you this question. Why is it that although many people are called to the wedding feast, only a few come and wear the wedding garment? Why is it that many are called to repent and believe in Jesus, but so few do? What is Jesus' explanation? Look again at the end of verse 14. Do you see it? Jesus says, but few are chosen. And Jesus means chosen by God. And what Jesus is saying is that only a few respond to the call of the gospel by repenting and believing in Jesus because only a few have been chosen by God. I think a few of you might be offended by this, but I don't know any other reasonable way to interpret these words. What Jesus is saying is that if, if at a specific moment in time, not only did you hear God calling you by his gospel to repent and believe in his son to be saved, but also you did that, then it's because God chose you. Let me put it another way. If you're an authentic, blood-bought, spirit-born follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, then it's because God chose you. In Ephesians chapter 1, we're told when and why God chose you. God chose you before the foundation of the world. And why? To glorify him. <laughs> 
He chose you before the foundation of the world to be saved, to glorify him. Now, follow this. Many are called, but few are chosen. We all are among the many who have heard the call of the gospel. But we who have been saved have not only heard the call, but also received the call. Why? Why did you receive the call of the gospel? Hear this, it's because God, based on his decision in eternity past to save you, He worked sovereignly and powerfully by the Holy Spirit through that gospel call in such a way that you truly heard God and you understood God and you were drawn to Christ in such a way that you responded with saving faith in Jesus. Through that general and external call, what God did was he effectually and internally called you. Or if you like, God made the general call effective to save you on the basis of his choice of you in eternity past. So according to Jesus' parable, this is the reason there are only a few rather than many at the wedding feast wearing the wedding garment that has been supplied by the king. Now then, Let's turn back to Romans 1, verse 6, and see if we can make sense of what Paul means when he writes that we are the called. In verse 6, Paul writes that we are called to belong to Jesus Christ. What does Paul mean? What does God mean as he speaks through Paul? Let's start with what Paul does not mean. Paul is not talking here about the general and external call of the gospel that the many hear. Instead, Paul is talking about the effectual and internal call of God by which his chosen, who are the few, are saved. Let me put it another way. In Jesus' parable, the called are the many who hear the gospel, but who do not necessarily get saved. But in Paul's letter to the Romans, the called are the few, whom God has sovereignly, powerfully, effectually saved by his spirit through that gospel on the basis of his choice in eternity past. You following the ball? (laughs) If not, that's okay. Hang in there. Let me break this down a bit more for us. Let me take a few minutes to unpack what this calling is that Paul's talking about. Let me me set before us seven biblical truths about this calling, and I think this will be easier for us to follow. Uh, Seven truths about this calling of God. First, if you're a real Christian, you were called by God the Father. Let's start easy. Called by God the Father. Although it's true that the Father calls you through his Son by the Holy Spirit, it's nonetheless true that the calling originated with God the Father. I think this is implied in verse 6. So that when Paul says you are called to belong to Jesus, he probably means you are called by God the Father to belong to Jesus. And this fact can be seen more clearly in other scriptures. For example, in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9, we're told that God, that is God the Father, is faithful by whom you were called. God the Father called you. Second truth. When God the Father called you, that was the very first step that God took in space, time, and history to save you. In Romans chapter 8, Paul will point out that in in eternity past, God foreknew you, God predestined you. However, when God called you in order to save you, it was at a specific moment in history. And when God called you, that was the very first thing God did in space, time, and history to apply the redemptive work of Christ to you. As a Christian, it's true, God has regenerated you. 
God has justified you. God has adopted you and so on. But the very first thing God did in time is he called you. God the Father called you. That's the first thing he did in time to save you. Third truth, when God called you, he did it through his gospel. It's only by his gospel that God calls anyone. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, Paul tells the Christians in the city of Thessalonica that God the Father called them, listen, through his gospel. God called you by speaking the good news to you. God called you by speaking the truth to you that although you were born a sinner who deserved to die, Jesus, the God-man, came down from heaven to earth, died on the cross in your place for your sins, but was buried and raised from the dead that whoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life in relationship with God. You heard the good news. And it was through that good news God the Father called you to himself. Fourth truth, when God called you, that calling was effectual or effective. And what I mean by this is that when when God called you, he spoke the gospel to you powerfully in such a way that he guaranteed that you would respond to the gospel with repentance and saving faith in his son. In other words, the calling of God was effectual in the sense that when God spoke the gospel to you, he worked within you in such a way that you truly heard God, you truly understood God, and you willingly chose to turn away from living in sin and for sin, and you willingly chose to believe in Jesus, surrendering to him as Lord, trusting in him as the Savior. The truth that God's calling was effectual can be seen in many places in the Bible. For example, Romans 8 verse 30 is again helpful for us. In Romans 8 verse 30 there, Paul writes that those whom God the Father has called, he also justified. There it is. The group of people whom God has called is the exact same group of people whom God justifies. And this shows that the calling of God, which Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 1, verse 6, is effectual. It is always successful. Ten out of ten people whom God the Father calls effectually through the gospel respond by repenting and believing in Jesus and therefore are justified and saved. The calling of God is effectual. It's effective. And this can be demonstrated by looking at other verses. In 1 Peter 2 verse 9, it says that when God called you, he called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. When God called you, he effectually called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. The call was not just an invitation to leave the darkness and enter the marvelous light. No, the call of God was the means by which God called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. In Romans 1 verse 6, it was by means of God's call that you were brought to Jesus to belong to him. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9 says that God called you into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. First Thessalonians 2 verse 12, we're told that it is God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Again and again, we see the calling of God is effective. In Jesus' parable that we looked at earlier, the many were called into the kingdom, but only the few came in. Why? Chosen? Right. It's because only the few were chosen by God and only the few were called effectually by God into the kingdom. When you were called, it was effectual. And this is because God worked powerfully by his Holy Spirit to draw you 
into saving relationship with Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul indicates this when he writes to the Christians that he knew God had chosen them. How did he know? Well, Paul continues by saying this, because the gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. That's the calling of God. Fifth truth, when God calls you, it was strictly on the basis of his grace. God did not call you into the fellowship of his son because, because you earned it or deserved it. It's not as if God lined up all of humanity and chose to call the best of the best to himself. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, Paul writes that God called us to a holy calling. God called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Why has God called you and not others? God hasn't told us. But I know this, the reason's not in you, it's in God. Sixth truth, when God called you effectually to belong to Jesus, that call was rooted in eternity past. And what I mean by this is that when God called you, that calling was rooted, according to Romans 8, in God's knowledge of you, his foreknowledge of you, and his predestination of you before time began. Not my words, Roman 8 words. And seventh, the calling of God is irrevocable. This is amazing. Irrevocable. And what this means is that those whom God has called will always be among the called. You cannot be uncalled. Having been called into the fellowship of his son, you cannot be ejected from that fellowship. Romans chapter 11 verse 29 says plainly that the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Irrevocable. Romans 8, verse 30 says that those whom God has called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he is also glorified. The called will be glorified. God has promised this. Therefore, the calling is irrevocable. It's irrevocable. Praise the Lord. So that's a lot to digest. Some of it might be offensive to you. But this is the word of God. Let's try to summarize it. Back in Romans 1, verses 6 and 7, what does God mean when he says, we are called? One scholar's definition is, I think, an accurate and very helpful summary. He writes this. I think it's on the screen for you, or will be. Effective calling is an act of God the Father, speaking through the human proclamation of the gospel, in which he summons people to himself in such a way that they respond in saving faith. I think that is dead on. Exactly what I saw in the word this past week as I studied it in detail. Now, how shall we respond this morning to what God has said to us? This is our last point. A great deal could be said here, but let me draw out three implications for us as a church. The first is this. Worship God. <laughs> Praise God. The reason you belong to Jesus, the reason you are a saint, a holy one, the reason you're in the kingdom of God rather than outside, the reason you have a seat at the wedding feast of Jesus is simply this, God called you. Praise God. Praise God. You would not have called upon the name of the Lord to be saved if God had not called you first. In Acts chapter 16, the reason that Lydia was able to pay attention to Paul's preaching of the gospel was that the Lord had opened her heart. In John chapter 6 verse 44, Jesus said, No one can come to me. No one can. It's a word of ability. You cannot. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. 
That's effectual calling. If you belong to Jesus, it's because God drew you to him. So praise God. It's for the glory of God that God called you. The Apostle Peter wrote, you are a chosen race. Why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Praise God. If we understand this doctrine clearly, we will praise God. Here's a second way we can respond today to what God has said to us. We must keep on choosing to live an increasingly holy life. We must pursue holiness. Back in Romans 1 verse 7, Paul writes that we are called to be saints. We're called to be holy ones. The recipients of Paul's letter were in Rome, but they were not of Rome. They were in the world, but they were not of the world. We are in Canada, but we must not be of Canada. God forbid. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Called by God to be saints, set apart from the evil world system, set apart unto Jesus. Called by God out of the darkness of sin and devil and death. Called unto Jesus to belong to him. This is who we are. But now the challenge is living who we are. Being who we are or becoming who we already are, what will help us to be holy? I think one answer is in Romans 1 verse 7, which we'll look at next Sunday, is where Paul says we're loved by God. We're loved by God. And so if we have been loved by God, we know the love of God personally, experientially, we should overflow with love back to God and show that love to God by seeking to please him and honor him, obey him in all things. We'll look at that next Sunday. And here's one last way we must respond to what God has revealed to us. We must keep on committing all of our evangelistic efforts to God in prayer. There are two things we need to keep on praying for. We must pray for God's help to get the gospel of God out to as many unbelievers as we possibly can. We must get out the gospel to as many unbelievers as we can faithfully and as clearly as we can, God helping us. This is our God-given mandate, our God-given responsibility for how are they to believe in whom, him who they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? We must tell people about the person and saving works of Jesus. And as we do, God will work through us to issue his general call to the many. His general call to the many, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Everyone needs to hear this. The general call needs to go out through us. And we need to pray for help to do that. But there's a second thing we must pray for. We must pray that God will help us to trust that he will work, just as he promised to call effectually the few whom he has chosen out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. We need to pray, God help us to trust that you will do what you've promised to do. The most that you and I can do by the grace of God is share the gospel. What more can we do? Only God can work effectually through that gospel to call his chosen into saving relationship with him. And I pray that you will know God measures our faithfulness not according to how many are saved through our evangelism. That number is up to God and God alone. And it's determined and it's fixed. And said God measures our faithfulness according to our diligence in getting the gospel out to the world. So let's pray for God's help. Oh God, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for speaking to us your glorious truth for us who are blood-bought, spirit-born followers of Christ. Thank you for calling us out by the gospel, out of the darkness, into the marvelous light of the kingdom of your Son. And we are so thankful to be called to the wedding feast of Jesus and to be clothed in the wedding garment of his perfect righteousness. Oh, that day when we sit at that table with all the saints, 
with Jesus. May that day come soon. And Lord, if there's anyone here among us who has not been saved, we pray that you will indeed call them out of the darkness by your gospel as well, that they would have a seat with us at the table of Jesus. Have mercy on us sinners whom you have now made saints, holy ones, called by you to belong to Jesus. And this is who we are forevermore. All praise and glory and honor be to you. In Jesus' name, amen.